the Marset man, Pastor Moses. God is good. Alrighty. We have some technicalities that we had to attend to. Hello, everybody. Hello. I would only ask you to stay standing for one verse of scripture today. It is a verse of scripture that is essentially a code to unlocking certain mysteries. It took a while for me to become acquainted with it, but I'm so glad by the Holy Spirit that I am, and now I can share it with y'all. Revelations 11, 7, we're just going to read it and then we can get into it later as the Spirit leads. Revelations chapter 11, verse 7. In fact, I did say one scripture, but 3, 8 is very instrumental as a foundation for really getting the meat of 11, 7. So let's take a look at 3, 8. We're not going to dwell on it very much just yet, I don't think. Jesus speaking here to the faithful church. In Revelations 3, 8, it says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Isn't that awesome? He says, I, 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 I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. Why did Jesus go to that extent? Because he knows your works. Come on. And now it says further, for you have a little strength, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You see, God is not looking for your own ability. He has all the ability in the world. He is just looking for your heart. The Bible says the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for that man whose mind is stayed on him. God is saying, I know your works. I know that your strength is little, so I'm gonna hold the door open for you. You see, so you don't have to worry about it, so wherever he sends you, you go, not in your strength, but in his name. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go to 11.7 real quick. Don't worry, I knew you were expecting 7.11, but it is 11.7 today. And then what does it say? It says, when they finished their testimony, when they finished their testimony, what happened? The beast ascended out of the bottomless pit. But the beast did not come to mark the end of their ministry until they finished their testimony. And so I want you to encourage yourself today and say regardless of what the enemy is machining in the world, not until I'm done with my testimony. I cannot be terminated in my assignment. I cannot be aborted in my ministry. I will finish my testimony and I tell you what, the reason why this thing is a code is because this is how you continue to draw strength from the presence of God. Because of the hope that you have that makes not ashamed. There is power in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, come on somebody. There is power. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power in His name. And that power keeps the door open for you. That power ensures that your testimony is complete. And the end is not going to come until you are done with your assignment. Hallelujah. Let's just give God praise as we get seated. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you guys. You may be seated. Thank you so very much. I just really like it when... Every single one of us taps into the, the potency of the presence of God. You know one of the things that the Lord's been teaching us lately, that the Lord's been drawing our attention to, as I have been teaching lately, is the importance and the significance of this one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It is very critical, it is very, very important because we know that Jesus is building his church. And he doesn't build his church on the consensus of opinion, but rather he builds his church on personal, what? Revelation. God does not communicate through the mass media. Right? Because Jesus asked his disciples, that what are they saying in the news? 
He said, who do men say that I am? He was probing into the consensus of opinion for the day. What are the pundits saying? What are the media outlets saying? And everybody had an opinion. Oh yeah, some said you're a prophet, some say that you're a teacher, some say that you are Elias that is reincarnated. And Jesus was like, okay, blah, 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 blah. But who do you say that I am? And the reason why we need to know that today is because we have many believers who are running their race based on the consensus of opinion. In fact, if one million people don't believe it, they don't want to believe it. If 10,000 people haven't liked that post, they don't even want to watch it. You see people going around, they only want to go to conferences that is oversold. They only want to respond to posts that everybody's liked. But the reality of it is God is never in the consensus of opinion. When the ministry of Jesus was getting ready to be wrapped up, the Bible says Jesus drove away the multitude because he didn't want them to bring noise as he's about to offer that final intercession to the Lord for the church to be birthed. You see, the Bible says he put away the multitude. And so we need to recognize that the Lord is doing the same thing again, which is he is looking for the ones that will be able to engage with him through the ministry of his Holy Spirit to draw personal revelation. He says to Peter, after Peter says, you are Christ, son of the living God, Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church upon the rock of personal revelation. You see, when you have personal revelation from God, you know what it can be likened unto? It can be likened unto you receiving a lamp that fits the circuit of your life. Every single one of us, we are a unique source of power before the Lord. Every one of us, we're unique. I cannot use your bulb to light my environment because my circuit does not accept the bulb or the lamp that you bring. It has to be one that is tailored to my exact circuit. And that is the reason why the Bible kept saying, let your light so shine. The Lord did not say, let other people's light shine. He says, let your. So that means there is a light that is your light. And that personal revelation is what Jesus is using to build his church. And that is why the devil continues to attack personal revelation. Because he knows that the moment Michelle begins to distill from the Holy Spirit, the revelation that describes the uniqueness of her purpose and assignment, it's over. Because that light is going to come on. And that's why the Bible says in the last days, men will no longer be able to stomach sound doctrine. They will heap up for themselves teachers who say what they want to hear. And what do they want to hear? They want to hear what everybody else is looking to hear. And why does the enemy operate like that? Because it's easy for Satan. Because Satan doesn't have that personal relationship with you. He is the higher lean. He just wants to group everybody together. He wants us to look the same, talk the same, think the same, so that one blow can strike everybody. Satan wants to melt all of our DNAs into one so that one little virus can take everybody out. Whereas Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. Jesus says, I do it on the one-on-one. -on -one. You know, recently I went back again to study. Oh, that might be a bit more echo than I need. I, I like it when I sound like an angel, but this, this time around it sounds too angelic. I don't know, maybe it's just me. It might just be me. Do you all hear the echo? Okay, that's good. It's not just me today. Praise the Lord. So the enemy attacks personal revelation because of the fact that we become more difficult to control when we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. When you hear God directly yourself, it is not easy for Satan to lead you astray. You understand what I mean? And so lately, I went back by the Holy Spirit to study once again, Medea. You know, the word Medea is where we got the word media from. So you have social media, you have the news media, you have all the media media things. And I've told you before, who is running the sound today? Is it you? Okay, you got it. Thank you. Happy. I appreciate that. So here is the deal. Satan has a child that he wants to rule the world through. Because Satan has no tricks of his own. Where is he going to get it from? The Bible says there was nothing that was made 
that was made without the word. Even strategy is a thing and there is no strategy that is outside of the word of God. And so what does Satan do? Satan looks at what the father does. He sees that the most effective heaven has been in reigning on earth in righteousness is through the son of God. And so he wants to birth his own son as well. And that is the one that we call the Antichrist. The Antichrist is, the word anti doesn't mean against. It's not like anti-malaria. You know anti-malaria means against malaria. But the word anti in its original sense and in the sense that it was used in the word of God means in place of. And so the Antichrist is Satan's own copy or replica or attempt to replicate Jesus. And when Jesus came into the world, the father didn't just send Jesus. Micah, Micah prophesied that before Jesus comes, a forerunner will come. The voice of him crying in the wilderness, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And so Satan was watching the father. He saw that the father brought John the Baptist before he brought Jesus. So ahead of the Antichrist, what is Satan bringing? I told you last week, come on, just last week, the false prophet. The Bible says that the false prophet will come and he will walk through false prophets and teachers to prepare the way of the Antichrist. And do you know who that false prophet is? The first prophet is the media. The news media because of the fact that, let me tell you something, all of what the devil is doing now is, is recycling ideas. Because the reason why it is called Medi media is because of the goddess Medea. And the goddess Medea is one of, is in fact, the only god or demigod that I know of that was said to have been operating with the prophetic gift was Medea. The most significant trait of the life of the goddess Medea was what? Was that she had the gift of prophecy, just like Balaam. How many people remember Balaam? Balaam had the gift of prophecy. He was able to see things. He was a gifted seer. And that is the reason why we cannot just follow gifts because there are people who are gifted in the world who are not using their gift to glorify God. And that's why Jesus says, many will come in my name, but by their fruits, you shall know them. And so it doesn't matter if you can tell the future. Anybody can tell the future. Octopuses tell the future all day long. You've seen those videos online wherein octopuses can make predictions because everything is math. The entire world that we live in is a set of mathematical experiences or equations that we receive as experiences. And God is not even hiding the fact that he's a mathematician and he's running everything based on math. Right from the beginning, he says the two shall become one because he doesn't want marriage to be an addition. He wants marriage to be an assimilation that we call multiplication. Right? Because if you say one plus one, what does it give you? It gives you two. So the only way one plus one becomes one is when you multiply it. And that is the reason why in marriage, you're not supposed to be looking to add to one another. You're supposed to help to magnify and multiply one another. God was not hiding his equation at all. He even said to them, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say be fruitful and add. He says, no, multiply. I am the one who adds. There's nothing anyone has that he has not received from above. I cannot add to you, you cannot add to me, but we can help each other to multiply. Amen. And so the devil knows that this is the way things work in the world and he is working that angle and we know that he repeats things. So what is he doing? He's bringing once again his goddess Medea. Medea is the goddess of enchantment. And that is the reason why enchantment, which today we'll call entertainment, is not separate from the media. Can I explain something to you, Father, so that you can understand the technicality of what the devil is doing? You see, the heart of entertainment in this world is called Hollywood. Hollywood is another word for a magic wand because the magic wand that witches and wizards use for thousands of years is effective mostly when it is made out of the Hollywood, which is a kind of tree. And that is the reason why they have that big inscription called Hollywood. Now, Hollywood now owns about 80% of the news media. And I know that we know that. I can't name names now because there's no need. But you already know these news outlets are owned. That's why you see the same people that are acting movies are the same people that are telling the news. And whenever they want you to believe anything, they go and bring celebrities who do not even have any technical understanding of what's been said. But because you have come to accept them in their idolatry, their enchantment works on you. 
Not the people in this room, of course. But in generality, the celebrity culture is a form of Canaanite idolatry wherein people don't believe what is being said because of the substance, but because of the mouth that is speaking it. We have come to elevate people to the position of God. So whatever they say, we just believe it. You understand what I mean? You just need to get the right person from the standpoint of acceptability to say the thing regardless of whether it's been tested or not. We don't test things anymore. When the Bible says test all spirits that you may know that which is God. If people come and say things to you and you ask them and you believe that they're like, oh, actually it was this person who said it and they keep throwing big names. We all experience this. Why is that? Simply because the enemy wants to revive his false prophet and that false prophet is an entertainer, is an enchantress. And they're not even hiding it because if they gave this media another name, it will not work. So they have to give it a name that has worked in the past. Medea is right there. And you don't even know the reason why it's called media. Because of the goddess, they are allowing you and I to summon this God every time. Why? Because the devil's power has been taken. And so for Satan to get anything done, he needs you to speak it. The Bible says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, the Lord has ordained strength. The power of life and death, they are in your tongue. You are the one with dominion. You are the one with authority. So when the devil wants to afflict you, he just comes to deceive you so that you can then use your mouth to speak death over yourself. You understand what I mean? Because if he can speak death over you, he would have spoken death over you like 500 generations ago. Before you came. Look at all the attempts that he made to kill Adam and Eve. But he couldn't because it was not given to him to do it. Look at when he wanted to attack Job. There was nothing that he could do unless God allowed it. So what does he do? In fact, his mission was to get Job to kill himself. He came into, into, in through Job's wife. And said, tell your husband to curse God so that he can die. You see what I mean? If the devil could have killed him, he would have killed him, but he couldn't. So he was using, trying to use the man to curse himself. And so the reason why the devil keeps getting us to speak these words is because if we don't speak it, it doesn't materialize. And that is the reason why they keep throwing a lot of falsehood. How do, that's why I mean, the news media is full of bad news. Because the devil knows that your primary assignment by God is the good news. You are supposed to spread the good news. But if you spread the good news, the end will come. Because Jesus says once this gospel of the kingdom, which is the good news, has been preached to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. And when the end comes, that means Satan has run out of time. And he knows that if the end comes right now, he's doomed because he's not going to win. And he's still living under the disillusionment that he will win. How did the devil get so deceived? Because there was an instruction by God from the beginning that Satan was not aware of. And that instruction was this, the deceiver himself shall be deceived. And so every time Satan goes to deceive somebody, he gets even more deceived himself. Because you must have been very well deceived and disillusioned to think that you can win against God. And that is why the Avengers are always trying to make you feel like they can defeat Thanos. All that disillusionment is to continue to condition us to sign up for the army of Satan. Nobody wants to sign up for a losing army. You're looking at an army that is losing and you're going to say, oh, <laughs> losing feels great, I want to sign up. Nobody wants to sign up. And that is the reason why the devil continues to make you and I feel like he's winning. And Jesus unveiled the strategies of Satan when he said to us, he says, do not be drunk with the wine of their enchantment, the wine of their carousing. You be sober and be vigilant. Because if you're sober and vigilant, you will see all of what the devil is doing and you will laugh. Because the Bible says he who sits in the heavens laughs because he's seeing all of what Satan is doing. How he's running elter skelter seeking whom that he might devour. But if you're not looking from above what he is putting in front of you can be scary sometimes. What is whispering in your ear can be confusing sometimes. But that is the reason why we need to be closer and closer to God because the one that you are closest to is the one that you hear clearest. So the devil doesn't want you to be close to God because if you're close to God, you will hear what is the spirit and the mind of God. And once you know what is in the mind of God by the Holy Spirit, then guess what? The devil comes and says all of that stuff. When he came to Jesus, like we were studying about two weeks ago, and he said to him, oh, if you are truly the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And Jesus was like, seriously? Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I am so close to my father that I hear his words very clearly. And the words that come out of him, they are spirit and they are life. That word is the bread of life. That word has already filled me. Why do I need to turn stones into bread? A lot of the reason why many of us are glued to our televisions every night wanting to know what is going on is because we have not stayed in the presence of God from morning until evening. If you have been in the presence of God and spent quality time, you don't have any business sitting in front of the news at night. Someone says, well, but we need to know what is going on. Yeah, but why don't you know what is going on even before it happens? The Bible says, will I do a thing without first of all revealing it to my servants, the prophet? The real things that are happening in this world, God wants to reveal it to you. But you don't want to hear the real thing ahead of time. You want to wait for the fake news that is already stale news. We do not need the world. The world needs us. Jesus says you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. But we keep living our lives as though we need the world. We have become so beggarly in our understanding and that makes Satan happy because then we outsource the power to Satan. Why would we do that? It's called the great deception. So I want to encourage you folks, plead the blood of Jesus upon yourself and make sure that you shut out whatever things that do not edify. We will soon be going into another season of presidential elections. Look at all the foolishness that's already happening with this runoff and all of this turn off and all of whatever spin off, whatever they're doing. And I keep telling believers, the word of God says that whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there is any praise, meditate on these things. So if anybody comes up with a political campaign and their mantra is putting somebody else down, it is not of God. Tell me what God has sent you to do. That's all I want to hear. I don't want to hear about the evil that the other person is doing. Imagine if Jesus had come and the entire time, he was, he was telling us all the bad things that the Pharisees were doing. Will that be called the good news? The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who went about doing good. He was doing good. He wasn't talking bad. But the devil has so deceived us into thinking that the more you can talk bad about somebody else, the more trustworthy you are. No, the Bible says a good tree produces only good fruits. And so if you're always speaking evil of another person, then I know that you are not of God. It doesn't matter if the pastors are bringing you up on stage every Sunday. You're going from church to church, being paraded like a stolen good so that the people can vote for you. The other day, I found myself in the meeting of some pastors and I said to them, the reason why many pastors are presenting politicians on stage is because they have failed to be teachers of the truth. Because if you have taught the people the truth, then you don't have to put your hand on the ballot box. I don't have to bring anyone on stage but the Lord Jesus. Because if I show you Jesus, when it's time for you to choose, you will not choose Barabbas. I'll say it again, just for man and leader. If I have shown you Jesus, when it's time for you to choose, you will not choose Barabbas. How do we know that we're in the last days? The very last city that Nimrod built, which according to the order of the system of this world is the very last strategy that Satan is bringing out, is called Shinar. And Shinar means the place where you choose between two. And that is the reason why today you are forced to choose between two. It's always Democrat or Republican. It's always this person or that person. It's always this or that. We have, been, we have come to the end of the ages. And the reason why people do not know how to choose, how did the ministry of Jesus end? The ministry of Jesus also ended in the plain of Shinar, where the people were forced to choose between Jesus and Barabbas. But because they did not know him, they chose the robber. And so I tell people, I don't have to tell you who to vote for. I don't have to... Take your thumb to fingerprint. If I have done my job as a man of God and as a teacher of the gospel, if I have painstakingly delivered to you the doctrine of the truth of the man of God, which is the son of man, you would not have to be told who to vote for. If I'm telling you who to vote for, I'm not teaching you how to fish. I'm just giving you crayfish. Yeah, crayfish, another word for crazy fish. So much cray cray around here. But I tell you what, folks, we will not be deceived. No, 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 come on. We, Jesus paid too much of a price 
for us to now be following the bandwagon of the people who are already wrapped in this political fraud. I am telling you, if you want to see change in this country, pray. The Bible says the only way you will see the peace of Jerusalem is when you pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem because in her you have peace. It didn't say fight for the peace. It didn't say lobby for the peace. It says pray for the peace of Jerusalem because this peace is only going to come through the hand of the prince of peace himself. But Medea is running around right now, the enchantress. Some days she looks like a man. Some days she looks like a woman. The enchantress is going around always changing form and that is the reason why they don't want you to have any distinction between one of the attributes of the enchantress of Medea is that sometimes she gets mistaken for a man. And that is because they want you to be so disillusioned that you cannot even pinpoint anything anymore unless somebody tells you and then you have to go by what they say. Satan's completely broken down the compass of many Christians such that now the only time they know what to do is when somebody tells them this is it. And if you don't tell them, they don't know. And that is the reason why you ask people to define today what is a woman. They, I don't know, you have to tell me. Whereas you're supposed to know. The, very, the only test that God subjected Adam to, to demonstrate to the entire host of heaven that the work was done of getting men started was he asked him to name the animals. And the Bible says whatsoever he called them was the name that was in the mind of the father already. That discernment is what is critical. If we cannot be discerning, we're so lost. Our problem is not the president. Our problem is not Congress. Our problem is discernment. If we can discern right, then we will see what God is doing upon the earth. Don't forget, it is not the elite that are ruling the world. The Bible says God is the one that rules over the affairs of men. But the elite want you to believe that they're the ones in charge. So that when you're praying, you're praying to them. Do you know how many times we pray to the elite instead of praying to God? We pray to principalities and powers instead of praying to God. And you're like, I don't pray to principalities and power. You don't? Every time you use the word they, you're like, oh, if they would just lower the taxes, if they would just make another road, if they would just drop the interest rate, who are you praying to? God is not the one who set the interest rate. He's not the one making the roads. But we, we, know, we don't know that we're praying when we're soliciting the help of the elite of the world to make our lives easy. When the Bible says whom the son says free, he's free indeed. You're already free of every stronghold that can ever be. But yet we bow ourselves willingly to Satan. Matthew chapter 4, Satan came to Jesus. After he couldn't get him to turn the stone into bread, he was like, okay, I'm going to show you something. He took him to a very high place and he showed him all of the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, you know, I can give you all these things. The world is always offering us the things that are already ours. And if somebody can get you to pay, even if it's just to pay obeisance for what is already yours, you know what you're doing in the process? You're first of all conceding it to them and then you let them give it to you and then you become their slave. And that was why Jesus looked at him and was like, really? He says, look, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Him alone shall you worship. You want me to worship you when in fact you are the creation and I am the creator? You are supposed to worship me. But we don't understand. Many of us, many people just walk around not knowing that the Bible says that there is no new thing under the heavens. One of the best ways by which you can understand how to deal with the enemy as we're talking about understanding spiritual warfare is to look at the way Satan's been operating from the beginning and then you understand that he has no new tricks. He's doing the same thing today. He wanted Jesus to worship creation and what is he doing today? He's trying to get us to worship creation. We want to reduce the population of human beings made in the image and in the likeness of God so that trees can and grow. I'm like, wow, what a strategy. People's lives are becoming increasingly difficult in the name of the worship of creation. If all the effort that goes into all this green campaign goes into elevating the human being, we will begin to see more of the glory of the Lord upon the earth. But now we are abandoning the creator to worship the creation. Anything that takes your attention has your affection and whatever has your affection is what you worship. God says, if I am your God, where is my worship? Praise the Lord. 
So let us quickly go back to that verse of scripture that we read earlier on, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I said we weren't going to dwell on it initially, but I want to read, in fact, what, one of the things that makes it easy is, you know, we're talking about God being a mathematician and he does things in numbers. This is Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Let's use those same numbers in the book of Psalms. Let me show you something from the book of Psalms 83. The book of Psalms chapter 83, verse 3. I believe it is. Alrighty. So um, there's a lot that's been going on lately. We've come on that. We've we've been through a lot of attack, particularly in this 2022 as a ministry. You know, we've seen the devil raise all kinds of oppositions. We've seen the devil possess people to use them against us, which is always his tactics. He doesn't have any new tricks. You know, he uses people that you are supposed to be able to trust and your people that you've, that you've done life with, people that you've bled over, people that you've called friends and made sacrifices for. He uses them against you. And Jesus warned us, you know, but sometimes we, we think that we're nicer than God. You know, Jesus says, do not cast your pearl before swine. He says, and do not give your good stuff to the dogs. He said, because after you have fed them, they will turn around and they will bite you. You understand what I mean? That was what Jesus said. He says, do not, do not feed dogs. Do, don't cast your pearl before swine. He said, because after you have fed them, you, you feed them, then they'll turn around and they will bite you and they will make rubbish that which is precious. So the devil does the same thing. He's been using people from time immemorial. And that is the reason why I encourage people don't let the devil use you. Because he's looking for people that he will use. He doesn't have the authority upon the earth like he have authority. When was the last time you saw Satan on CNN? Yeah, but he doesn't come up as CNN. He comes as an angel of light. He comes as people who have your interest at heart. You know, they sound like, oh, what we're seeing in this country is so pathetic. He's so this and that. And that's because they want you to believe that it is pathetic. They want you to believe that there is no hope. They want you to believe that we're in a difficult situation. Whereas we're just hours away from the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in some of the best times, but you wouldn't hear that in the news. Because the Bible says that when you see darkness upon the earth and immorality filling the earth, he says at that point in time, the cup of wickedness is getting full. What do you do? Look up because your redemption is nigh. But he disguises himself as an angel of light. And so, even though I knew, but sometimes I want to know more. So I was asking God, like, man, why so much opposition? You know, sometimes you, you ask because there is always more. The Bible says he, he knows who seeks to know. So don't just assume that you've known everything God has to say about a particular subject. Keep asking. You understand what I mean? Because let me tell you something, the first two or three impressions you may get of a thing could actually be by Satan who disguises himself as an angel of light. So don't just say, well, with the moment I met that guy, I just knew, the Holy Spirit just told me that he is the one. Uh, but sometimes, it is not the Holy Spirit, it is the devil. That's why the Bible says, test all spirits. They may have come in the, Jesus says, as many will come in my name. He says, but by their fruits, we shall know them. Be a fruit inspector. So when they say that they're from God, the Bible says love believes all things. I believe you. But what do you do as a believer? Trust but verify. Even though I believe you, I want to see the fruits. Oh yeah? Because I'm not following you from here to there if I don't see the fruits. Don't tell me that the fruit is on that other side. What if I get to that other side and there is no fruit? Then I have been deceived. No. Show me the fruit first and then I will go with you. You understand what I mean? And so we need to know how to test our spirits. Otherwise, the devil will take advantage of us. So the times that we have come into, folks, we cannot overemphasize being close to God and making sure that even after we think we know, to still seek to know more. He says, ask of me and I will give you a sign. I think, who was it? What was that prophet that we were studying a couple of months ago? I'm trying to remember his name now. He, the Lord said to him, I want to give you a sign. And he says, God, I already believe you. I don't need a sign. And God says, look, I'm not going to be here dilly-dallying with you. You have wearied men. Will you weary God also? I said, you need a sign. And God says, I will give you a sign. Because, say that again. 
Say that one time. No, no, it wasn't Gideon. It wasn't Gideon. Gideon was asking for a different kind of sign. But it will come to me. I'll remember and I'll tell you. But at the end of the day, the lesson we need to draw from that is this. When God says there are seasons of your life that you will come to wherein you will be guided by signs, don't just take one sign. Take several signs. Remember when Jesus was born, the wise men, they saw his star in the east. And they didn't stop when they got to Herod. They kept following the sign until it stopped. So there were several times that they had to spot it. Because the star was not just there one time. It was there several times. So I'm encouraging you. We've come to a season of signs wherein you have to seek a sign. So that you're not taken to the wrong king. Because I know many people are looking for a king. <laughs> when they came to Herod, Herod was a king but was not their king. What did they give Herod? Nothing. That means they did not recognize him as a king. Because back in the day, when you meet a king, what do you do? You give to them precious things. And when they got there and they found the little boy Jesus, what did they do? They gave to him the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And guess what the significance of that was? They were coming from the east. They were magi. You see the way God works? Is these people were magi. Do you know who trained them? It was Daniel who trained them. The Magi who came, they were of the order of the Chaldeans that were trained under Daniel in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says that they went to Nebuchadnezzar and it says, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we have found one in whom is the Spirit of God. And to us, he is like a demigod. And we know that whatever he says is as good as the word of the Almighty who made the heavens and the earth. They said, let your people follow him, follow him that they may know how to discern what the stars are singing. That was the birth of the Magi. And that was almost 1,600 years before. The way God operates. It begins a thing from the end thereof. And so if we know that God already has packaged and prepared everything, then why are we being surprised by what the world is doing? We should not be behind what Satan is doing. We should be ahead of it. Yeah, the, the church needs to wake up. But the, the, the deal is this. Okay, let me read to you this Psalms 83. And then I'm going to put the two together. The Bible says in verse 3, of Psalms 83. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. The original English translation says your hidden ones, which is very consistent with the way God operates. God, God always has people that he's hiding. He always hides people. I was telling my wife the other day, asking my wife if my wife remembers a message that I preached in 2018 or 2017 at a small house group that we were running. When the Lord revealed to me that it was a man that was hidden in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. God hid a man in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. His name was not going to be revealed. But if you look at the names of the people around him, you will find who he was. And guess what his name was? His name was Joseph which is interesting. But the, that story for another day, let me not get into that. But one thing that I do know is that God always has hidden people. Right? But you know, the people that God hides don't find it funny. <laughs> you see, God uses certain people to do special things on the earth. But it doesn't reveal them until it's time for them to strike. So before they strike, God has to hide them because he knows Satan is busy looking for them. And so some of the reasons why your light hasn't shown like you want it to shine, the reason why only two people are following you on YouTube is because God is hiding you. Oh, why isn't this good news? I thought you were going to be excited about this. It is some good news. This is what God does all the time. He hides people. He hid Moses for 40 years. He hid Jesus in Egypt. The Bible says that it might be fulfilled. That which was said, said by the prophet. That out of Egypt I have called my son. And here you are. You're asking God. Why don't people know about me yet? Why can't I be seen? Why don't people even remember me? 
The other day they sent Christmas presents to everybody. They didn't send to me. Yeah, because you have been hidden. Because God is preparing you for something special. He hid David to the point wherein his own father forgot that he existed. Now think about it for a moment. This was at the time wherein men will not even have their daughter's name written in the records. Now let, let's, let's put that in perspective. When David was born, daughters, their names were not written in the public records. Because people weren't that proud that they have daughters. Because from that perspective, she's going to go to somebody's house. My sons are the ones that will inherit me. And that is the reason why when you look at the account of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, Matthew did not really record the supernatural birth of Christ. He recorded what was in the tax books because he was working for the IRS. He was a tax collector. And so he went through the genealogy of Christ through Joseph, even though Jesus wasn't Joseph's seed. But Jesus would pay tax and he would be the one to pay the debt that Joseph owes because he was born in his house. And so the genealogy from the tax collector's standpoint was not of the supernatural, but it was for the natural. And all of the names there were the names of men. But when Luke came, he wrote the genealogy of Jesus Christ through the woman because the word of the Lord says the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And he recorded the angelic visitation and the voice of God that was heard upon the earth. When you understand that that was the way the people process things, every son that they had was important to them. It didn't even matter if it was had by a maid or a mistress or a concubine. It was their son. Look at the 12 tribes of Israel. Maybe about half of them were born by, by, by house helps. You understand what I mean? But Jacob was beyond proud of his sons. If anybody comes near his sons, he beat them. Like, yeah, you can't. And, and God hid David to the point where his own father, who was a public figure, he was the speaker of the house. So when they say that he was the head of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was like the Congress. And so he was like the speaker of the house, a well-known figure, and he did not even remember his sons, and he didn't even have that many. He was not like the Joe Blow next door who had no job, who just kept popping out babies. He didn't have that many sons, and yet he forgot that he had David. And that was because God was hiding him. And after David slew Goliath, and David was enjoying celebrity status, he had a little bit of celebrity um, exposure. God looked from heaven and he saw that even the women were singing the praises of David and God was like, no, 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 this is not good for business. It is not good for business. He raised persecution and forced him into the cave of Adullam. Adullam, what does Adullam mean? Adullam means the same thing as Laodicea, which means the judgment of the people. God will use people's judgment of you to hide you. People will say all kinds of things about you. They will pass their judgment of how you're a false prophet, you're a false teacher, how you're a this and that. They will make up all kinds of things. You're a wife beater, you're a money embezzler. They will say all kinds of things because God is using the cave of Adullam, the nonsense that they're speaking to create a wall around you to hide you until it's time for you to strike. But if you don't know that that is how God operates, you will be busy fighting the walls and God is like, no, 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 those walls, I put them there. Don't try to refute what they said. I made them say it because it's not yet time for you to be seen. I remember when I was at the university and I was like, I was invited by the dean of my faculty and he was like, we're looking at your records from high school. By the time you came into this school, this university, you had one of the most outstanding, outstand, uh, what's the word? Outstanding. I was going to say outstanding at the same time. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's correct too. One of the most remarkable results. He said, but look at you now. If not that you were smart enough to take a leave of absence, we're about to kick you out because your grades, your grades aren't adding up. And he was like, you need to do something. He said, because you are supposed to be on my list. When I came in, I came in on the dean's list. I hadn't even written a single exam, but I was on the dean's list. After a couple of semesters, I was on the way out. So when I left the place, I was walking around and I asked God, I said, God, he said, yes. I said, what is going on? He says, look up. He says, look around you. He says, you don't see them, but I do. He says, there are people here who must not know that you exist. I was like, ah, you're playing that game. I know you do that. And so I turned around and I went home. I said, if you want to hide me, I would even help you. So I moved my things out of campus. I moved to town away from school. I'm like, is this hidden enough? Was like, yeah, that's a nice, that's a good start. 
You understand what I mean? And the moment people, a lot of people knew that I was staying in that place, he allowed for a flood to come and destroy the roof of the place. I had to move to somewhere else. And so when I moved to that other place, I didn't tell anybody. Oh yeah, I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm tired of moving. I'm gonna just stay here and help you hide me. Because that is what God does. And it doesn't matter how long he, how long he hides you. I have barely lived as long as he hid some people in the Bible. But when the time comes, he's going to bring his glory out. Because when he hid David in the cave of Adullam, when the time came, he brought him out. Moses the same. Everybody. Abraham, for the first nine years of Abraham's life, he was, hi he was hidden. He was hiding in the house of Shem because Nimrod was looking for him that he may kill him. Like Jesus too. When we were in worship, you know what the Lord said to me? <laughs> he said, today I want you to remind your brothers and sisters that it's not okay for them to be bored. The Lord says, do not be bored. He said, because you are bored, because nothing is happening. He said, but when nothing is happening, that is when I am doing the most things. Do you know that there are men, come on, praise the Lord. You know, sometimes I wish I'm like some preachers who will set things up for a hand clap. You see what I mean? But I just want to get the truth out. And that's why sometimes I just, I kind of like drop a, yeah, a quote that you can tweet and I just want to keep going. You know, I need to find some reading. So let's try that again. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Because I'm supposed to say things like, when it looks like nothing. Oh, you didn't hear me on the side. When... <laughs> The Bible says that bodily exercise profit little, but godliness is profitable. You see, when it looks like nothing is happening, your natural tendency in the flesh is that you want to be bored. Do you know how many people, the Lord says come on this side and say it. Do you know how many people get into relationships because they're bored? Do you know how many people start businesses because they're bored? Get jobs because they're bored? Because they can't see what God is doing. And because they can't see what God is doing, they think they need to help themselves. You are never a God unto yourself. You have a God who is a heavenly father who loves you and cares for you. Let him do it. He says in Psalms 52, he says, I am the one that will perform the things that I have said concerning you. So if it looks like God is not doing anything, it's taking too long for him to bring the man. It's taking too long for him to bring the money. Oh, wait for him. The Bible says he that will come, will come. And he will not delay. Even though from your perspective, the Bible says it looks like he's delaying. The Bible says, wait for him, for he will surely come. And when he comes, the Bible says he will be riding on a horse into glory. So you will know that it is him. There will not be any guessing. Or is he the one? You see, when you're saying, is he the one or should, uh, we should expect another? It's because you have not come close enough to see the blind sea and the lame walk. The ones who were asking if Jesus was the one or if they should expect another were the ones who were assessing Jesus from afar. And he said to them, he says, go and tell John the Baptist the things that you have seen. He says, the blind see, the lame walk, those are the fruits. Because the assignment that I gave you and will help you out, the difference between the works and the works is that one work is an attempt to get God's favor and another work is fruit that you have born because you have God's favor. So you cannot do any works to earn salvation. But you have been saved by grace through faith. And now that you have been saved, the Bible says, now do the works, which means bear the fruits. So Jesus says, look at the fruits. Again, inspect the fruits. So I'm saying to you, as the Lord said to me, do not be bored. God is hiding you in the cave of Adullam. There are no swings. There are no um, escalators to amuse you. There is nothing to play with. You just feel so bored out of your mind. Yes, because God knows that if he doesn't take you through that process, your flesh will be in the driver's seat. So he allows for you to go through a period of being hidden so that whatever wants to grow within you that is not of God will be starved to death because nothing grows without light. I already got ahead of myself, but it's okay. We'll catch up with it. See, the Lord is saying, I have hidden ones. So I've come to encourage you today. You are one of his hidden ones. Amen. Praise the Lord. And when the time comes, the people looking for you will find you. 
when the time comes, the ones who are bringing you goodness will find you. Jesus was hidden, and yet the wise men found him. The king could not find him, but the wise men found him. So let's read on. Let's, let's read that verse 3 again. The Bible says, They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Verse 5, For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. This one world order is not about saving the forest in Brazil. This one world order is not about global warming. This one world order is not about adopting a religion that is supposedly up to date. This one world religion is about taking away the sovereignty of nations. And once the sovereignty of nations are taken away, the sovereignty of the believer is next. In case you have not been following, a lot of the United Nations agenda is secretly to take away the sovereignty of nations so that the United States of America ceases to be, Canada ceases to be, there is no Nigeria, there is no Cameroon, there is Cameroon, there is no Australia. They want everybody to just be one because they want to reveal Nimrod again. They want to re reveal Nimrod, they want to reveal Ra, they keep calling Satan all these names that he has manifested himself with in the past. They want to bring that order of Osiris again. And they have crept into everywhere. Even the people in government that you are supposed to be able to trust, they have been hijacked. Remember when the dollar was updated and they put in the back of the order, the return of Osiris. And we spent that money without even knowing what it means. They wrote it in Latin and they don't teach it in schools. So how do you even know what is written on the money that you carry? And they put in God we trust, but they write the name of the God that they're talking about just below it. And they put a symbol there, which is the all-seeing eye, the eye of Osiris. And this is supposed to be the nation of God's people. But where were we? The Bible says that while men slept, Satan came and he sowed tears amongst the weed. And it is now, in fact, Matthew says it's happening all over again. What they're doing right now is all of what they've been planning. Now is the time when everything is coming in too. I was going to say fruition, but I don't like to use the word fruit when the enemy is doing stuff. So they're bringing it to bear. They're bringing the destruction. You see what I mean? There's a movie that came out recently and it came out on the 11th of the 11th month. It came out 11, November 11th, 2022. And those are four 11s, right? Because 22 has two 11s in it. And 11 is the number of destruction. Number four is the number that is associated with the final destruction, which is the destruction brought about by the horsemen of the apocalypse. And when the first trailer was revealed, they actually spelt out their agenda in the trailer of the movie. And they says, now destruction comes. I heard it. I played it again, and by the time I told people to go and watch it, they couldn't find it. Even myself looked for it again. They took it out, but they released it for a couple of days, letting you know the reason why they chose that date was that movie was about the destruction of the elect. They have taken consent together as a confederacy, and that is the reason why the Lord has hidden you so that when the devices of the crafty has been confused, then the Lord is going to bring you out so you can take your place in the world. So the object of my message today really is to encourage you to know the times that you're in, to not be afraid, but at the same time, do not be asleep. Open your eyes and make sure that you're not deducing anything from the media or from other people that God is not personally saying to you. It doesn't matter how well they package it. It doesn't matter how many people are saying it. In fact, the moment many people are saying it, then you know that it is not true. The Bible says that broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are the ones who trod it. But narrow is the way that leads to life and only a few are found in it because it is called the path of righteousness. So I want to encourage you, be weary of where the majority are gathering because where the multitude gathers is where the pillars will crumble. So I want to encourage you. Let me, let, me, let me wrap up on this note. Matthew chapter 6. Come with me to Matthew chapter 6. And let's read from verse 44. Matthew 6, 34, sorry. What does it say? It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Sufficient for who? 
for the day is its own trouble. The trouble of the day is not for you, it is for the day. You see the way God wove this thing? The people who are planning the trouble, Psalms 83 verse 3 says in their hearts they are planning the trouble that they may cut you off so that you cease to be a nation under God. Right? We just read it. It says they did, did Psalms 80, 83 from verse 3 to 5 that we just read. They want to cut you off so that Israel can cease to be a nation under the Lord. They are thinking that all the evil that they're planning as a confederacy against the Lord is against you and his anointed. But the Lord is saying, that's what they're thinking. But the best their trouble can ever be is a trouble for the day, not for my anointed ones because I have hidden them so well. So rather than getting bored that God is hiding you, praise him. You may not be the most popular amongst your friends. That is the reason why you should praise him. You may not have had all the exposure for your business that you desire. That is the reason why you should praise him. Because he doesn't want you feeding the army of Satan. Do you know that many of us, if God had given to us the desires of our hearts when it comes to financial prosperity, we'll be paying for Satan's guns? We'll be paying for Satan's artillery? Because God wants your discernment to be sharp. Let me, I, I've told you this before, but let me explain it again. Why did God send David to a cave? Could they not have been hidden in an open field somewhere? But he sent him to a cave. And when I started to inquire of the Lord, I said, God, why do you like hiding people in darkness? Why do you like hiding them in the place? He said, because a time is coming wherein darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. So I'm training them in the darkness to see with their ears. Because in the darkness, you don't see. Why does God train you in the darkness? Because he knows that the false prophet that is the forerunner of the Antichrist is an enchantress that is going to come with a sleight of hand trying to deceive you. But if you're not looking, you can't be hypnotized. So I'm not even looking at what you're doing because I have learned to hear. And one day the Holy Spirit took me to a place and he clapped and I heard echoes from everywhere. He says, that's why I train my prophets in the cave. He said, because I need them to know where the sound is coming from. If you stay in the cave for just five minutes, you can never tell where the sound is coming from because the echoes have very similar intensity. It takes being in the cave for a very long time to be able to say, that's where the sound is coming from. There it is. It takes that longevity in your training. So God is not being mean for keeping you where you have been. Alan, no, he's been loving for keeping you there long enough until you know your left from your right, until you know how to discern where the sound is coming from. So be encouraged, my friends. It is not yet time to be famous. It is not yet time to be popular. It is not yet time to be accepted. Paul went through the same thing. And you know what he did? He encouraged himself in the Lord. After everybody, including Peter, the apostle Peter, after they all deserted Paul, because they didn't like what he was saying. He was too bold, he was too confident, and his opinion was too anti-social media. So everybody distanced themselves from Paul, because Paul was the guy that you invited from your church. And then your members start to question what you have been teaching. And so you don't want to bring him back. No, that happened in, the, in scriptures. They invited Paul to certain places and after a while, the Bible says the people got up, the people of Berea, and they started looking into the scriptures to see what their other teachers had been telling them because this one has the word of life. And so they didn't invite him back. And so the devil came to him and told him, you see, you are doing too much. The devil boxed him into a corner and tried to tell him that he was doing the most. And you know what Paul did? He got up one day and encouraged himself in the Lord and he says, I am accepted in the beloved. You think he said that because people were celebrating him? He said that because he, nobody was returning his calls. <laughs> he said that because nobody was checking up on him. So he had to encourage himself. And he said, I am accepted in the beloved. Why did he say that? Because he had visions of heaven and he saw the cloud of witnesses and he saw that every one of them, Abraham, David, Moses, they were at some point rejected by their kindred. And he says, this is the company that I belong to, the company of these rejects. They were rejected by men, but accepted by God. Amen. 
And in conclusion, in conclusion, please do not seek the approval of men. Because what they do not have, they cannot give. Anyone that has not received the approval of God cannot give you any approval that you need. Simply because many of them are living in fear by seeking the approval of the world. The church became what it became today because the church was looking to be approved by the world. And so we started playing their music. I was going through some Jewish scriptures the other day that the Catholic fathers did not include in the 66 books. And when I was going through these Jewish scriptures, it was revealed the very moment in time that Satan came and taught somebody how to play certain kinds of music that aroused the desire for pleasure in human beings. And I'm like, that is the reason why people go to certain places because of the music. It is part of the enchantment. Let me tell you something. It is not yet time to seek that which is popular. It is time to seek the Lord. You see, the moment you lighten the load and you tell yourself nothing will satisfy except for the righteousness of the kingdom, the Father will begin to speak to you. He will appear to you. I tell my wife, I say some of the times that I've heard God the clearest have been the times that I've been abandoned the most. Some of the times that I have felt closest to heaven have been some of the times that I was the brokest. Oh, yes. Because money is also a God. That's why Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon. You have to choose. If you're still serving mammon, God would allow for you to go through a period of not having that mammon so that that mammon does not have you. Let's go lean before the Lord. Let's lighten the Lord. Because that is how we're going to hear his voice. So I told you that these are the times that you need to walk by what you hear and not what you see. And someone says, but brother Moses, but the Bible says that you shall not walk by sight, but you will walk by faith. But you are saying that I need to walk by what I hear. What is faith? The Bible says faith comes by hearing. <laughs> and hearing comes by the word of God. Another verse of scripture says, whether you turn to the left or to the right, the Lord is saying when you get to the plain of Shinar, which is the last frontier of the strat strategy of the kingdom of this world, he says you will hear a voice saying to you this is the way. God is not saying you will see a path. He says you will hear a voice. And how do you hear the voice of God? I've been teaching you and reminding you, you hear God's voice very clearly. The more familiar you are with what's been written down. The written word is the key to the spoken word. And then when you hear it, how do you understand it? The Holy Spirit. He says, ask of me and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. It's okay for you to read scriptures and not understand it because you're reading what you do not know. And that's when you consult the Holy Spirit and say, hey, Help needed. What, what are you saying here? You know, like I told you, was it last week? You may want to go listen to the message that I preached on Tuesday. Because Tuesday, or no, I think it was Saturday last week, I recited the prayer that I say when, I, when I'm studying the Word of God. I don't say that prayer as much anymore because then I would say, because I would cut out a block of time to study the word of God and I will say that prayer at the beginning. But now, I don't say it as much simply because I am, how do I say this? Um, um, I don't cut out chunks of time as much anymore, but I'm studying the word of God all the time. You see what I mean? Even when I'm not opening the pages, I'm reading the ones that I have memorized. You see, but don't kid yourself until you have memorized enough to be able to sit down and meditate out of the resources that are here. The Bible says it this way, Jesus speaking. He said that a scribe that is already instructed in the things of God brings from his treasures things that are both old and new. I consult new scriptures, I load up new scriptures, but the ones that I've already loaded up, there are times when I just bring it in. It went in by prayer, it is surrounded by prayer. So when I'm bringing it up, it is full of potency. And we need that because, let me tell you something, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let us rise up and pray. We're going to pray today before we break bread. Samuel cannot believe that I've finished preaching. So when I say let us stand up, he smiled. He was like, really? Is this for real? Oh, yes. It's, it's a new day. You know, uh, the Lord's been dealing with me and my wife's been dealing with me even more. Oh, yeah. And, and then my daughter also. And I'm like, man, all these people are saying, uh, my daughter and his daughter. 
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, you said it. <laughs> so here is the deal. The prayer that we're going to say today is of two kinds. Let's try with one scripture. And if, if we're not getting it, or if I don't feel we're getting it, we'll try with another. But the first scripture is, can anybody guess? Oh, oh sorry, can anybody discern? My wife said Jeremiah. Nice try. No, no, but this is a scripture that we read recently and it was like this. We got up to pray. Matthew chapter 7 verse 3. And it says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But you do not consider the plank in your own eye. The Lord is saying that we have been too busy examining other people. And the work that he's doing, is doing in you. He wants you to be able to actually get understanding from what he is doing with you by first of all observing that which is even clearer. You understand what I'm saying? We are in a season wherein you can determine what God is doing around you by getting a better understanding of what God is doing within you. Amen. You know when I notice that the Lord is staring me up to pray, I begin to brace up for what is coming around me. Because God doesn't just give you the, the grace to pray. You know, you come to a season and it's like, even subconsciously, you just find yourself, Mukum Sayala, Udibia. You're just walking around speaking in tongues. You try to blow the leaves in your backyard and you're like, Hukum Badara, Mumburubadi. He's a, and it's like that easy. And you're like, oh, this is good. I'm enjoying this. Brace up. Because the reason why he's getting you to do that is because of the fact that you will need it. You see, the way God operates with us is when God is going to take you out to use you in the field, he plugs you in and charges you first so that you don't die out on him on the field. Do you know that as far as God is concerned, we're like machines, we use power. That was why Jesus told his disciples, he saw them and they were on 5% battery. He said to them, he says, do not attempt to do what things I have told you. He told them to go preach the gospel, but he says, hold on, wait until you have received power from on high. They had to be charged until the indicator went up. The Bible says there appeared upon each and every one of them cloven tongues as a fire. That was the indicator. Then they could go out to the field. And after 30 minutes, they were running out of juice. God had to plug them back in again. You know, in Acts chapter 2, they were charged to full. By Acts chapter 4, the Bible says that they could not overpower the opposition of the day. They had to go back into hiding. And that was when the Holy Spirit came and fired them up again. They were so charged that when Ananias and Sapphira came and touched them, they were electrocuted to death in an instant. And the Bible says everybody else was like, in the Acts chapter 5 opened with this statement, and the fear of the, of the apostles came upon all who were without, such that they can only behold them from afar. God wants you to be that charged. So that's why he's hiding you. He's charging you in the dark. So how do you understand what God is about, what God is preparing you for? Look at how he is charging you. If you come into my garage, there's a garage that is my garage. So that's why it doesn't have to be tidy all the time. My wife hardly comes in there, so I can do whatever I want in there. So I've got my tools all over the place. When you come in there, you can tell what I'm about to do next because I've got different batteries. Pretty much all the tools that I have are battery operated. And so you can tell by what I am charging the equipment that I'm about to whip out. You understand what I mean? And so when you look at what God is doing in you, then you have a good idea of what he's preparing you for. So stop busy poking your nose into other people's circumstances and issues. First of all, understand what God is doing with you. It will save you a lot of time and do you good. If I let me help you with another verse of scripture. Psalms 119 verse 2. It's, it's a scripture that I believe we do not quote enough. The Bible says, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. The Lord said to me one day, to seek him with your whole heart means to seek to understand what he's doing in your whole heart. He's working in your heart. But you want to go up to heaven to see him. And it's like, well, if you go there, I'm already here. I'm working in your heart. What work am I doing in your heart of late? Let your heart focus on that. It will help sharpen your discernment a great deal. You may want to table out your testimonies. Write down the things that God is doing in your life. By the time you do that, you have a good understanding of how he's leading you and what he's preparing you for. So that when the time comes, you are not caught unaware. So you know that dream that you shared with me today? Now you know what it is. 
Because that is the Lord letting you know how he's preparing you in your heart for what he's about to do. He's about to lead you in such a way that obedience is key. And that is the reason why he showed to you the things that he showed to you. You understand what I mean? And so be encouraged. When God asks you to come to communion house, by many people's standards, this is not the most fun place to come to. Because most churches, they even pray before you come in. And once you come in, everything is entertaining. But you come in here, you think you've come late, but still pray. <laughs> oh yeah, because some people come in and it's like, oh, by now worship is over. I'm just going to sit down and hear the word. And then Alan comes to grab the microphone and he pretends like service just started. And you see him going, oh, she was so hot. And it's like, really? Did you people not pray already? No, it is called the house of prayer. We pray all the time around here. And you cannot escape praying in our communion house. But if the Lord is leading you here to such a rigorous training, then you know what he's preparing you for? He's equipping you in such a way that you can be part of his special forces in the last days. But it takes being patient. It takes being willing to go for years without being famous, without being known. It takes going through this process for years without being invited to come and speak at someone else's church. It takes through going through this. And God is looking for the people that are willing to truly seek the righteousness of the kingdom as opposed to seeking cheap popularity. I remember the other day we were celebrating Alan's birthday. Anyway, let me not go there because Father, we thank you. I heard this very, very quickly. The Lord said to me, ask me and I will do it. He says, ask me to lift your hand and I will lift your hand. And so ask him to lift your hand. The Bible says lifting up the arms that are weak. You know those things that you have been doing and you're getting tired of and you feel like your arm is getting weak? And you just want to throw in the towel and just rest on another man. And the Lord is saying, no, it's not time to rest on the man just yet. Just ask me to lift you up and strengthen you. The Lord is saying, it's not time for you to get another loan. I'm just asking you to trust me. Ask me and I will lift your hand. Lift my hand, O oh God. The Bible says that the Lord is the glory and the lifter of my head. My horn shall be exalted like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil my horn shall be exalted like the horn of a unicorn and I shall be anointed with fresh oil secum diale abizum diale I saw a lady, she says, but Lord, I have prepared. I have swept the floor. And the Lord says, sweep it again. You're not as ready as you think you are. The Lord says, sweep it again. There is still stuff that you missed. Go to the corners, sweep it again. The Lord says, the one that I am sending to you is a dignitary. And everything needs to be swept Everything needs to be clear. You can't afford to hide anything under the carpet when this one comes. Otherwise, it will stumble and together you will fall. So the Lord says, sweep it again. How many people desire to have a dream in the night that is prophetic? You want your desire to see and to wake up and to remember. Father, we thank you. Ah, my mambere de city di alama. Oh, the Lord says, Ask of me, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Now I declare that the heavens will open above you. And I thank God for the ministry of the angels that will come around your bed at night, and they will begin to create the melody. 
for transport. There is a melody, there is a sound that takes you up. They are coming to create the melody that will levitate you into the cloud of revelation. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, thank you. The Lord says to me to let you know that you will see the calendar of his operation. You desire to know. You've been asking, Lord, when? Lord, when? The Lord says, come and see. He's right here. They will take you to where the calendar is and it will flip but very quickly. It's not going to stay open. It will open and it will shut. In the moment that it opens, you will receive divine instructions around divine timing. You will receive divine instructions for divine timing. Oh, the Lord says, Manuelita, I have them where I need them to be. And when the time comes, I will move them forward. The Lord is the one that is advancing the ranks of the ones that you have been praying for. So you just keep praying for them and the Lord will advance them in the ranks. They will believe as they should believe. They will submit as they should. They will know as they should. They will run as they should. You just continue to pray for them. The timing for their progression is in the hand of God. The Lord says that the time for this land has come. And whatever judgment comes is for your elevation. So don't join the opposition that says there is a casting down. By God, it is a lifting up. The instruments of men may fall but you will rise. Mammon has to be demoted so that the Lord can be promoted in your heart. And so don't worry, do not be taken by what the confederacy is doing. They come together, but the Bible says, since the gathering is not of the Lord, it will not hold water. It will not stand. The Lord confuses the devices of the crafty so that their hands are unable to carry out the works of the enterprise. Job chapter 5, go and meditate on that verse of scripture. It is a powerful sleep tool. Sometimes when you're troubled and you don't even know why and you cannot sleep, your heart is picking up on the craftiness of Satan. The Bible says the Lord confuses their, de their devices. Hey, great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. The Lord will take you to the mountain of his holiness. All you need to do is delight yourself in him. Delight yourself in the Lord. And it will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and it will take you to his city of lights. Delight yourself in the Lord and it will take you to the place of his holy habitation. He will take you to the place where there are many mansions. Delight yourself in the Lord. Alrighty, we're going to break bread. Micah. Uh, love, love, love the prophecies of Micah. We're going to break bread. We haven't read this scripture in a while. I cannot miss it. So we're going to go to Micah chapter 1 verse 7. Rakoko koko ti yele do su tu yege. Ibage, ibage. You see, ah, I just saw you, Alan. You were trying to turn back the clock because you felt like there was something you missed. So you wanted to go back and replay it. And the Lord says, don't worry, it's coming back again. So just keep that pace going. You will see it again. Another round of revelations which is going to be like the one you have seen, only this time around, it is more indelible. It is more indelible. It is more visible. It is more legible. Alrighty? And so trust in the indelibility of the finger of God. So don't worry about trying to go back. Keep going forward. And you shall see great and mighty things. Did someone remove Micah from my Bible? Oh, there it is. Micah chapter 1 verse 7. Please take the bread and hold it in your hand and declare this prophetic word over yourself. After Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, before they learned how to grow anything to eat, there was a time that the Lord had to bring them food and it was a plant, but it was said that it was made to become bread. 
and wine. The Lord has always been interested in, in giving us the experience of the body and the blood of Jesus. Because without it, we cannot have a part in him. He says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have a part in him. And what is the flesh of the Son of Man? He says, this body, this bread is my body. This wine is my blood. So I should take the body of the Lord Jesus today, ready to eat of his body and drink of his blood again in remembrance of him. Go to what it says in Micah 1.7. It says, all her carved images shall be beaten into pieces. All her pay as a hallowed shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a hallowed, and they shall return to the pay of a hallowed. We have come to a time wherein God is separating us from the world. The things of the world, while we were prostituting ourselves to mammon, those things that we have acquired in the process, the reason why the Lord has to remove those things from us is why we are still, if, they, if they remain within us, we will trust in them. And Isaiah 45 says, those who trust in the carved images on wood will not be saved because those idols cannot save. So the Lord is saying, I'm still purging my people. We're still in a season of deliverance where God is helping to energize our faith to believe the word regardless of what the world is saying. Do you know that quite often we're so accustomed to only feeling excited about things when we see the money for those things? And the Lord is saying, I want you to be excited just because you see my word. Because if the world pays you for your prostitution, imagine how much more God pays you for your obedience. He is more faithful than the world is. Yeah. Yeah. When Jesus says even the world knows how to look after his own, he was saying that even the world, how much more your heavenly father. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father. And the Bible says, Paul speaking in Acts, in Romans chapter, chapter 8, he says that if God did not withhold Jesus from us, will he not together with him freely give us all things? And then later on he was testifying because then he was reasoning in the Holy Spirit that will he not together freely give us all things? A couple of years afterwards, what did he say? He says, now we have received of him all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has given to you all things. So when you see him taking the world from you, when you see the economy no longer as strong as you want it to be for you to feel safe, let it happen that way because God is weaning you from the world so that you can trust only in him. This is for confidence, O oh God. We receive the body of Jesus. You may eat of the body of the Lord. And as we eat of his body and drink of his blood, we do so in remembrance of him. Let our hearts be inspired by the breath of God into remembering fully well the promises that have been made so that we can stand on those promises because any other ground is sinking ground. Thank you for the life of Jesus that was poured out so that we can then have that life to live. We have been crucified with Christ. I want you to say it like Paul said it. I have been crucified with Christ. Even though I live, nevertheless I live, yet not I, even though I live, yet not I, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ living in me, the glorified life. This is the glorified life, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the only begotten of the Father. As I drink of it today in remembrance of him, I drink unto glory, even the glory of the Father. He doesn't share his glory with any man, so I know that he is coming fully for me. The Lord is coming through for you. You may drink. Praise the Lord. It's interesting how after a while y'all just stop saying after me because you're like, yeah, he's doing the most now. But he's okay. He's okay. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, if you have not been praying, there's no need to be shy. Let me tell you something. There's been a release of that grace to pray. But if you know you're not there yet, there is help. 
at the altar. Because the Bible says that by the laying on of hands, we stir up the gifts that have been deposited by the presbytery. By the what? The eldership. You have served in several places. You have listened to teachings. You have been in ministries. You have sat at the foot of several. And so since things have been deposited within you, but you've not been able to fully access them. The Bible says that by the laying on of hands, the gifts are stirred up. And so if you want to be stirred up in the area of praying and intercession and enjoying a sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit, I want to lay my hands on you today as it's been recommended in Scripture, even commanded by the Lord for the activation of such graces. So if that is you, we all go through those seasons. I've been through seasons myself wherein it was just so hard to pray. But this season is your season to not faint, but to pray. You will be energized in the spirit of your mind because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Now let that river be ignited within you. Flow by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I want you to say, fill me, Holy Spirit. Come upon me, Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive an infilling of the Holy Spirit that helps your intercession. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the wind of heaven come upon you. In the name of Jesus. Sekum shubrakamu sigeda baraba baba baba baba. He get do shotolo do rike de braka santa la de rike de brodo shotolo do rike de braba kande rike de brodo shotolo do rike de ba. Ifatha, let every impediment drop from your mouth that you may speak in a new tongue, that you may speak by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. He's here and he is your help. And he wants to help you to pray as Jesus prayed, to intercede as Jesus intercedes in the mighty name of Jesus. It is your season to pray even in the night. So your issue is finding the time, knowing the time. Yeah, the Lord said to me that you're looking for the time. You see, the moment you think about it, begin to pray. And that becomes the time. You have been recalibrated in the mighty name of Jesus to pray. You don't need to find the words. Just find the heart. Let the Lord reveal to you what's in this heart. And then the words will come and you will pray and intercede even for others. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to go to the book of Matthew and start to pray Matthew. Whatever things you see there, begin to pray. When you read about John the, John the Baptist, who was the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare the ways of the Lord. Say, Lord, I want to help prepare your way. Lead me, use me, and make myself available. Begin to pray scriptures, right? Because you see, the Lord showed to me that you're looking for the words. You know, I see you pacing back and forth, and then you're getting lost in your own thoughts because you can't find the words. No, the word of God are the words that you need to pray. So pick it up and begin to pray. We pray with excitement, pray with joy because it is a sweet fellowship when it's been done with the Holy Spirit. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, help your daughter to make the most of this season. In the name of Jesus, let everything be shared with the Father. Share it all with the Father. Pray about it all. You don't have to whine about it. You don't have to... See, just present it to the Lord by the understanding of His love. So when you think about it, think about what a loving father would do about the situation. And that is what you need to bring before him. And he will show himself faithful and strong. Make the most of the season of this time that we're in to intercede and to pray. Pray even in the face of your children. Let them know that you're praying. You see what I mean? Even when they're trying to talk to you, let them know that you're praying. Because by so doing, they would also learn to pray. So let nothing get in the way. It is okay to pray everywhere and to pray all times, at all times. So pray everywhere in your house. Just go around and pray. In your car, pray. In your closet, pray. In your kitchen, pray. In your garage, pray. Just pray all the time with all manners of prayers. Some of your prayers will be songs. Some of your prayers will be groanings. Some of your prayers will be words. Some of your prayers will be tongues. With all manners of prayers. In this season, pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. It's a different season. You will hear God very clearly as he hears you in the place of prayer. I want to pray for my brother Greg. He is not here today, but I pray that the grace of God will be all over him, will strengthen him in the mighty name of Jesus. His elbows will not crack out of lack of grease, but the grace will be the grease in his elbow in the mighty name of Jesus. Woman of God, you desire to pray 
Makushe le deri kero do soto do tori galama da broko soto lo dori gidebra. I pray for you that in this season you will have angelic visitations in the mighty name of Jesus. Soro moko do shi yala baraka da seto le dori gidebra. Father, in Jesus' name, this man was brought here for such a time as this, so that he can be equipped for the next assignment. Yes, yala. Oro mashata la dori gidebra. Oh, the Lord has spoken to you very greatly in the course of today. So just meditate upon the things that he has said and do not move until you feel the wind of the Holy Spirit in your back. The Lord is going to lead you. You're going to go out passionately. The Bible says go out in joy and be led forth in peace. You will go out joyfully. You see, if you're not yet joyful, just wait. That means he's still filling you up. When he fills you up, you will go out not hastily, but joyfully. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now let every bridle that is in your tongue drop and then your mouth will open up and you will pray to God. You will pray for hours and not even know time has passed because you will have so much fun in the presence of your Heavenly Father. You are of the company of them that wake up in the middle of the night to catch that very first watch in prayer and to be caught in prayer when that first watch comes in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Did I not pray for you? Oh yeah, please come close. Roko koko ko shuto la mandari ya mausi. Gendu sumra da kande ya la makado soto lo dori gede brosho soto lo dori gede ba. Shut the door behind you. Shut the door behind you. It's an instruction for divine determination. To be divinely determined to pray until you know that you have touched the throne of God in the mighty name of Jesus. This is your season to break through in the place of prayer. You will pray with tears flowing down your eyes over your cheeks and yet joy in your heart because you know that you have met with the Lord that is that season for your divine encounter in Jesus name praise the Lord God is good let's proceed at one minute praise God praise God praise God praise God oh yes hallelujah okay God is good um, what we're going to do next very quickly is because we have all this so much time that I have saved us we're just going to sit down very patiently and listen to the announcement. Uh, tomorrow, no, it's not tomorrow, it's Monday. Monday, uh, by the grace of God, I'm going to be on television, um, Atlanta Live, and they have invited as many of us as want to show up to be the live audience there in the studio. And so as many of you as can make it, what time do we need to get there, John? Six o'clock. So six o'clock, we'll get there, we'll make, uh, we'll make ourselves comfortable and be ready for the broadcast. Uh, the address and all of that information is in the WhatsApp group. And so if you're not in the WhatsApp group, be nice to somebody who is and they can share the information with you. Because uh, I don't have it, but everybody else has it. So you, you can go find somebody. Um, I don't have it to hand is what I mean. And, but if you can come out, it'd be great to come out and just, um, yeah, let's have, it, let's have a time of fellowship. But if you're not able to come out, it's gonna be live, right? Seven o'clock. On Atlanta Live. Okay, that's why they call it Atlanta Live, because it's live. It's gonna be on TV, it's gonna be on Facebook, it's gonna, so if you don't have cable, don't worry, you can watch it on Facebook, you can watch it on YouTube. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. It's gonna be an amazing time in righteousness. God bless you, keep praying, keep dreaming, but more importantly, keep feasting on the Word of God. You need it. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty. If my brother can help me with the offering slide real quick, we're going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Let's prepare our hearts in worship and giving. What a mighty word tonight. I don't know about y'all, but for me, this has been off the chain. What else can you ask for at this hour? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we have our giving details here. Father, we give you praise. If you need an envelope, you know where that is, right here on the made new sign, as well as the basket. Father, we thank you. We love you, O oh God. We thank you for the seed that you've given us, O oh God. We just thank you for this mighty season, O oh God, that you bless us. For your word declares, come and buy you who have no money. And Father, you teach us. You take us by the hand, O oh God. And we give thanks. 
Lord, let these offerings unto you be sweet smelling. Let them be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. And let it be a sign of our thanks unto you, of our worship unto you, O oh God, for you have placed it in our hands. Lord, we thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you have granted upon us, O oh God. Take us further. Take us into the depths of your presence, O oh God. Look upon us this week. Father, we thank you for how you have dealt with us this season, O oh God, and we ask that you continue to do so. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everyone have a blessed week.